Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, AJ Hogue, where AJ's more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's AJ with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm AJ Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program, Speak English Powerfully. Speak English fluently. Speak English effortlessly. Commit. Commit, commit to my VIP program. Think in English. Go now to EffortlessEnglishClub.com and VIP members, add my pronunciation course. Also at EffortlessEnglishClub.com EffortlessEnglishClub.com Well, I'm talking to you from the same location next to the canal. The water, the little artificial river here in central Osaka, south central Osaka. I actually have to move. My first location, I was near a bridge and there's this comedy team practicing on the other side and they're screaming and yelling and super loud and it's echoing. It's too loud. Much too loud. And that's to my right. Then looking to my left, just past another bridge, it's uh, another comedy team. They're jumping around. I don't know what they're doing. They're acting crazy. Jumping around doing crazy stuff. It's the same guys from yesterday. Same two guys. So one kind of tall, skinny guy and another guy who's shorter and fatter. <laughs> that's kind of like a comedy team stereotype, right? Because in America, that goes all the way back to uh, Abbott and Costello. You know, the early days of uh, early movies. There was a famous um, comedy team in America, Abbott and Costello. Also, Laurel and Hardy. That was another comedy team in the United States. And both of those, it was the same kind of guys, right? It's uh, the tall thin guy who's kind of the more serious one and then the short fat one who's the silly crazy one so this must be this is kind of a stereotype for comedy teams and I, I guess this is still true here in Osaka interesting <laughs> thinking today thinking about you know the alchemist and finishing the alchemist this message we discussed yesterday of you know the highest truth and how these even just these kind of questions okay not even the answers okay we don't have to agree with Coelho's answers but just the questions these 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 very deep deep uh, big questions the seeking the looking for these highest truths right what is the meaning of life what is the true nature of the universe right not just what we see what appears to be true but what is the deeper truth what a, what is our meaning humanity's highest purpose what is my meaning you or me as an individual what is my or our highest purpose right what is my highest purpose what are my important meaningful missions in life what is wisdom really and what is the deepest wisdom the most important truths what is God you know we have many words for this God Allah Brahman Tao 
the universe, the multiverse. This idea of a unity behind all. You know? What all comes from. What all returns to. How do we live a good life? The best life. How do we truly free ourselves, free ourselves from suffering, right? From ignorance, from evil. Well, these are the big, deep, most important questions humans have been asking for thousands and thousands of years. As long as we have history and writing, we know humans have been asking these questions, looking for the answers to these questions, doing their best to give their answers to these questions. We can even guess when we look at some of the, the cave paintings of prehistory, before written history, when we uh, consider the old stories that, that are older than writing, right? They're older than writing. Uh, eventually, eventually, they were written down, but we know that before writing, they were just told, right? just spoken and memorized generation to generation to generation until finally someone wrote them down. We know, for example, that the Iliad and the Odyssey, that's what may have happened. Others like the Aeneid, we know were written down by the writer, Virgil. But we know in all parts of the world, humans have been asking these big, important questions. And then we have now. We now have a worldwide culture, meaning a media culture, an education culture, a political culture. In fact, in many places, even a religious culture. that discourages us from these questions, that tells us these questions don't matter, that tells us, oh, don't think about those questions, they're too big, they're impossible to answer. Right? We have a worldwide culture pushing us to focus on small things, Trivial things, meaning extremely small and unimportant things. I was thinking about this, and I realized that this culture we have now, this, this culture of triviality that seems so meaningless. I started thinking, why does it seem so meaningless? Why do so many of us feel an emptiness in society, in culture, in life in general, right? And this is why. Because the most important questions, journeys, searches, have been closed off. They're discouraged. I mean, of course we can do them still, and we are, you and I, but many, 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 many people who just grow up and go to normal schools and uh, watch normal television and read the books they're told to read and believe the news that they see in the newspapers and on the television and just watch movies and, you know, the, the normal popular culture that we're all fed now, this globalist culture, which is mostly the same everywhere. And what is it? What is that culture? You know, first we have to diagnose the disease. We have to understand the disease of this culture. Why it's so empty. Why it leads to such unhappiness. 
why it's so unsatisfying, why it's so shallow. I mean, what is it? What are we really getting from this culture? And actually, you know, a lot of people have conspiracy theories, right? These secret conspiracies. But in fact, this popular culture of TV, movies, modern books, all modern entertainment, modern education, meaning schools, the agenda, the purpose, what they're trying to push and teach us and telling us is important. It's actually very, very, very open. They are completely open about what they are teaching us, about what they are promoting, what they are pushing, what they are selling. Now they sell it in a simple phrase, a simple phrase that sounds cool. It's a, this is an American phrase. There may be different versions in other countries, but in America, here's the phrase. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This was a phrase, I think it started back in the 60s, 1960s, to kind of describe the hippie 1960s rock and roll cool youth culture the new culture right not that boring old culture the new cool exciting culture and it was this little phrase they used to describe it it's a famous phrase you'll hear it in movies many times sex drugs and rock and roll and it's always said in this way like it's really cool sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's exactly what they're selling us. They're completely open about it. And that's what they're pushing on us in schools, in media, everywhere. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now that's their phrase. It's, that's a marketing phrase. It's made to sound cool, right? Sex, ooh, exciting, right? What's more exciting than sex? Yeah, so exciting. Drugs, right? It's meant to, you know, marijuana and LSD and all this cool drugs, right? They're, they're not talking about the, the bad side of drugs. They're talking about party, party, get drunk, go wild, crazy, freedom, yeah! And then rock and roll, same idea, right? Loud music, dance, total freedom, do anything you want. So much fun, it's so cool. So that's their phrase. It's the phrase they use. But I have my own phrase, which is more accurate, which more uh, clearly describes what they are really selling us, what they are really teaching us, what they are really pushing. It's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll only. It's perversion, addiction, and noise. Perversion, addiction, and and noise because of course it's not just sex that they're constantly pushing they're pushing all kinds of perversion perversion means of kind of sick unnatural pleasures or desires right they're pushing like this whole trans thing where men pretend they're women and inject themselves with hormones and cut off their penises and put on dresses and we're all supposed to pretend that this is really a woman and we're supposed to call him she it's a perversion that's a perversion perversion is kind of like the word corruption it means taking something that's true and beautiful and making it something else making it ugly and untrue if you pervert something or you pervert someone then you take something that's beautiful or good or innocent and you do something bad to it and then it becomes ugly and suffering and untrue and that's what they're selling us. It's not just sex. It's perversion. It's Sex is the exciting marketing they use to bring us into all kinds of different perversions. Right? We have even worse than the trans perversion. We They're selling us pedophilia now. 
not quite openly, but very close to openly. Pedophilia is uh, sexual desire for children, raping children, basically, sexually abusing children. Just look at advertising, how young the models are getting now. Look at children's television. Look at the Disney Channel, which I hate that company. They are evil, evil, evil. Walt Disney is an evil company. If you look at their television show, the shows that they have for kids who are like 10, 11, 12 years old, look at how the girls dress on those shows. Start doing some research on the internet about some of the things that have happened to the actresses on those shows, the young actresses and actors, in fact, the young boys, the young girls, 12 years old, 10 years old, sometimes younger. Horrible stuff. Truly horrible. Like I said, it's not quite open, but it's very close to open. And they're pushing it more and more. In the online media, you're starting to see uh, more and more people writing articles, actually apologizing for, apologizing meaning promoting for, defending, defending adults who want to have chil sex with children. They're popping up more and more now on the internet, on sites like Huffington Post, mostly left-wing sites. It's clear where they're going. They're going to keep pushing, pushing more perversion, more perversion. It's the same with the trans stuff. They're going to continue pushing ever more unnatural, disgusting sex. Perversion. Perversion is also not only sexual, but in terms of truth. They pervert the truth with lies, right? They will tell a half-truth. Uh, for example, the news, the journalism is now all fake. You can't trust any of it. You can't trust any television news at all. None of them. Not one of them. Can't trust them at all. Newspapers, magazines, they lie, they lie. They have perverted the truth. They have perverted the news media completely. Right? Changed it from truth into lies and deception and programming. Another one you'll notice. Start noticing. I'm noticing this more and more with advertising. They are starting to push ugliness. Ugliness. Right? They're perverting beauty. We all recognize beauty. It's a natural reaction we have to beauty. Not only beauty like a, you know, like a beautiful woman or a beautiful man, but even, you know, architecture or building. Right? We can recognize. We see certain buildings and they are beautiful. And we see other bu buildings and they, they're ugly. It's instinctive. It's intuitive. It's natural. But more and more and more. This worldwide culture is perverting beauty and pushing ugliness, ugliness, ugliness. They're trying to, again, it's a kind of lie, a perversion, where they present ugliness and they, they say it's beautiful. You'll see this, I'm starting to see this more with models. They'll use big, fat, ugly women or men, but usually women, uh, to model or, you know, to put on the front of a magazine and they'll say, oh, the new beauty. And they'll, we're all supposed to pretend that this woman's beautiful, but she's not. She's fat and unhealthy. She looks terrible. She's got tattoos on her. She looks, she's ugly. We all know she's ugly, but it's a perversion of truth. And we see it with men too. Uh, architecture is a big one. Modern architecture is ugly, 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 right? And we're told it's, oh, it's amazing. And they'll do a story about some big skyscraper, a big ugly steel cement rectangle. And we're all, and they'll, they'll pretend that this is beautiful and amazing, but we can all look at it and we all know it's ugly. It's a perversion of truth perversion of beauty corruption 
This is the first thing they're pushing. They call it sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They say sex, but it's really perversion. All these different perversions. The second one, they say drugs, but really what they're pushing is addiction of all kinds. Addiction. What is an addiction? Addiction is when you become the slave to desire. You become a slave to some craving, some desire. And this is why, again and again, during The Alchemist, I have been, I've had a very negative reaction about use the, the use of the word desire in this English translation that I have. Desire, desire. All desires are good. No, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not. In fact, desire is probably the number one weapon, one of the main weapons that evil this evil society this, this this evil lying media and culture and schools and are using they use desires against us they want us addicted they encourage addictions because the more you are addicted to more and more things more and more little desires the more of you slave you are the easier you are to control right if you're an addict, like for example, an extreme example, if you're a heroin addict, a, 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 just a complete drug addict, you're not going to think about those big questions about life and meaning and truth and beauty, right? You're, all you're going to focus on is getting heroin. I gotta get more, I gotta get more, right? As soon as you have some, it feels good, then it's gone in a short time, and now you feel terrible and now you need more. You're addicted. You're addicted to the desire, the pleasure of heroin. And because of that, you become a slave to that desire. You become a slave. And your mind, your body, and your spirit all become weaker and sicker, weaker and sicker. The more and more you become addicted. Of course, you know, this modern society, this media culture, schools, etc. It's, they're pushing all kinds of addictions. And it's not really heroin, although certainly there are heroin addicts. But what are the, what are the addictions that they push so very strongly for all of us? Right? Not, it's not so much the illegal ones, it's the legal ones. The ones you can easily buy or get alcohol right alcohol addiction they push this very strongly they push it in the United States for example uh, especially in high school and college if you watch 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 shows movies even TV shows but especially movies about college kids in the United States or even high school kids and they're constantly constantly showing these kids getting drunk or getting high and partying and acting crazy and it and they make it look like so much fun yeah 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 I can tell you this really is the college culture of the United States I mean I went to college in the United States I went to a big school and indeed that is the culture it is a drinking party culture. The, the culture in the States, the, the whole mindset for many, not all, but many, many, many of the college kids is that you go to college, now you're free of your parents, it's time to go crazy. And what they mean by go crazy is get drunk and act stupid. Now, a little of that is okay, that's part of life. But the problem is a whole lot of young people indeed become alcoholics. My first roommate in college, university, as a freshman, 18 years old, my first roommate was an alcoholic. I walked into the dorm room the first day and met him. He had posters on the wall of, for, for beer advertisements. And in just two quarters, we were had a quarter system, so two quarters of school, after two quarters, he failed. He had to leave school because he was just drinking and partying all the time. He didn't go to class, he failed, and he was out. I don't know what happened to him after that. But, you know, it, I don't believe, I personally don't believe alcohol is evil. I don't even personally believe drugs are evil. But addiction is. 
and addiction is really uh, presented as fun and exciting in this globalist culture. But it's not just alcohol. It's not just drugs. Food's a big one. Junk food, right? This is encouraged. Sugar. They put sugar in everything. All these processed foods are full, 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 full of sugar. And also salt and other garbage. They encourage us to become addicted to food. They encourage us to become addicted to media. Social media, especially Facebook and, and the like, are designed to be addictive. There was a Facebook executive who quit. He quit the company. I think it was last year. And he said the reason he quit was he felt that Facebook was hurting people. It was damaging people because they were programming Facebook to be addictive. And he realized that this addiction, this social media addiction was uh, uh, making people less happy. Right? I mean, look, just look around you. How many people walk around staring at their phone all day, ignoring their friends, ignoring their family, ignoring the sky, ignoring the world around them, just constantly doing, you know, Instagram selfies and liking social media posts. They want us addicted to that. They want us addicted to TV, movies, all these distractions are designed to be very addictive, right? They're designed to give you little, you know, emotional highs, right? They make you excited and make, first maybe they make you upset and then they make you excited, right? So your emotions are constantly being pushed up higher, pushed up, pushed up, pushed up. And that creates an actual chemical kind of addiction in your brain when this happens constantly and they design this to happen at an, on an exact schedule, you know, they time it with minutes <laughs> in each show, you know, at, at every few minutes, there's a, uh, some little bit of excitement, some little bit of, uh, suspense, something to, for your emotions and you become addicted. It's not an, a it's not an accident. So addiction in a, in general, this globalist culture where being programmed with encourages addiction to physical pleasure addiction to physical pleasures where it's it's called hedonism it's a kind of a lifestyle or a life philosophy that says that you know the answer to life the, the most meaningful thing in life is just to feel physical pleasure sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Hedonism is what we are being programmed with. Okay, so it's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's perversion, addiction, and the third one, noise. They call it rock and roll. Rock is dead, my friends. I'm sorry. Rock is dead. The Who sang that. <laughs> but of course we know it's not just rock and roll now. That was back in the 60s. But now, you know, now there's techno and rap and all this other stuff. But the, the more general thing they're selling us and conditioning us with and programming us with is noise. Just a general noise. Now, noise has a couple different meanings. I'm using the most general meaning. A specific meaning of noise is for, you know, hearing, for your ears, right? It's just kind of loud sounds that are chaotic. Chaotic loud sounds. Sounds that don't have any meaning. It's just loud and distracting. But we also use, scientifically, we use this idea of noise as really any information. Any loud information that is distracting. And that's what I mean by noise. <laughs> right? Constant. We are bombarded, meaning we're constantly hit with noise, visual noise, right? Our eyes are constantly hit with uh, trivial information, information that's not deep, that's not important, that's not meaningful. 
and it's just constant everywhere you look for example you'll see advertisements if you walk around a city right billboards and advertisements and signs and you can't escape it you can't escape it the visual noise is everywhere it's the same with sounds I mean right now as I'm talking to you I'm just feeling some irritation because I cannot escape the freaking noise of this city right down here by one bridge there's these two guys screaming and yelling as they practice their comedy now on one hand it's nice they're practicing their comedy but on the other hand they're not they're not respecting everybody else around them they're not just practicing they're screaming as loud as they can and making a huge amount of noise secondly you might be able to hear there's a building where they're doing construction next to me and they're throwing stuff around and making a huge amount of noise bang 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 but it doesn't matter because there's nowhere to escape it in this modern world I already know this I, if I go out to the street then it's gonna be cars right there's no quiet it's distraction they want us constantly distracted they don't see if you're distracted by trivia if you're distracted by noise all the time by meaningless noise then you don't think about these deeper questions you don't ask these questions you don't look for answers to these questions and so why are they pushing all this why this agenda this plan to push perversion addiction and noise well because it makes you and I and everyone else very very easy to control right just easy to sell us a bunch of stuff a bunch of trivial stupid stuff keep us focused on small unimportant things don't question don't think deeply always feeling a little unsatisfied I mean always feeling a little bit lonely a little unconnected always feeling like there's some meaning that's missing and then they sell you stuff and they control you with that and that's what the globalists want right and that's why this this seems the same everywhere you go right modern music is just noise it's, it's garbage it's garbage I have to admit this even myself even when I listen to some of the music that I really like you know that I grew up with as a kid for the classic rock and roll you know it, I can appreciate it it's it's fun music but on the other hand you know it is kind of noise I look at the lyrics I look at the words and the meaning of the words of those songs there, there's nothing deep there's nothing beautiful there's nothing meaningful really it's kind of trivial music and sometimes if I feel trivial it, it be, can be kind of fun to listen to that music but you know we're this kind of music is being pushed on us so much I mean so many young people their whole identity is focused on what music they listen to right I'm a country music fan and they ha they listen to certain bands and this is like who they are and they if, if somebody else listens to other bands that they don't like then they think oh that person's not cool that person's an idiot they don't right no 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 this is cool we have this is so strong in America where you have whole identities whole groups of people their whole identity is focused on a certain kind of music or a certain kinds of bands that they listen to and it's just trivia you really listen I mean they might be good musicians the music might be pretty good you know skillful but there's really no deeper meaning to it it's a it's a really shallow trivial thing to make your identity who you are your values that's the point I mean to be honest I don't think we really had beautiful music since I don't know the 1800s <laughs> I think we had the most beautiful music uh, somewhere around that time and then since then at least in the West it's gotten worse it's mostly noise right and it's gotten more and more perverted 
But it's the same for TV, it's the same with movies. I can hardly even watch movies anymore. I used to be a big movie fan, but now I realize it's just so full of this, uh, the same thing, you know, pushing perversion and addiction and noise and uh, I, I can't even watch movies anymore. I can't enjoy television anymore. So if that's the disease, this globalist disease, and it's true everywhere, right? It's all the same. All music's the same everywhere now. Right? It's the same. It's the same globalist music everywhere. Same freaking ugly, uh, trivial m music uh, that is popular in Korea, in Japan, in uh, Eastern Europe, and in America. It's all the same. You know, it's rap and hip hop and variations of that. So in Korea, they have a Korean person doing it, but they're wearing the same stupid clothes with the baggy pants and whatever, and they're doing the same stupid dance moves. And then you watch a video from England, and it's the same, it's the same crap. It's exactly the same. There's no uniqueness. There's nothing Korean about that music. It all comes out of, you know, marketing departments. <laughs> There's no culture anymore. They've destroyed the, the traditions, right? Korean music used to have a connection to Korean history, to Korean culture. It had a meaning that was deeper. A connection to ancestors and traditions. Even the instruments used were part of that. Modern Korean music is just garbage. It's just globalist, corporate garbage. Same true for American music and British music and, I don't know, uh, Georgian music, Russian music, Japanese music. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. So what do we do? This is the disease. Perversion, addiction, and noise. Perversion, addiction, and noise is the disease. A global disease being pushed on us by people with a huge amount of money and power. People who own all of the media, all the television, who control the schools, who control most governments too. What is the solution? What is the antidote? What is the medicine? What medicine do you take if you're sick with perversion, addiction, and noise? If everywhere you look, everywhere you go, it's a culture of perversion, addiction, and noise. Surrounded by perversion, addiction, and noise everywhere. Luckily, there is some medicine may not taste good in the beginning. It may be a little difficult therapy to deal with in the beginning, but ultimately it's fantastic. Ultimately leads to much deeper peace, happiness, more and more freedom from suffering, deeper feeling of purpose and meaning and love and connection in your life. You've got to take this medicine because if you follow this global culture that's being pushed on all of us. If you just passively follow the perversion, addiction, and noise, you will become more and more and more unhappy. Each year you get older, you'll become less and less happy. More and more unhappy, more and more miserable. Okay, so what is it? What are the... It's very simple. What's... What are the solutions? What are the antidotes, right? How do you fight against sex, drugs, and rock and roll? How do you fight against perversion, addiction, and noise? Well, with their opposites. Truth, self-discipline, and beauty. Truth, self-discipline, and beauty. You develop those in yourself. You search for those. You look for those. You don't need all the answers. Right? No, right? Be, humans have been asking these questions, those big questions I mentioned at the beginning. We've been searching and thinking and uh, looking for and trying to answer those questions for thousands and thousands of years. And we have found some answers, but we're not gods. We're limited, so we do the best we can. But just by trying, just by searching, like Santiago, you get closer and each step closer to truth each step closer to self-discipline each step closer to beauty natural beauty brings more happiness more meaning 
more purpose, less suffering. Truth. Let's talk about the first one. Truth. Truth is the antidote. Antidote is kind of a medicine against poison, right? It saves you from poison. The poison is sex and per perversion, really. So the antidote is truth. This is why I talk about the red pill. This is the most basic level of truth, red pill. Red pill truth, we're just looking at society truth. We're looking at political truth, uh, social proof, truth, right? Because this is the first basic level, the everyday social life we live. We're taught lies and lies and lies about what it, what it is. We're taught lies about uh, men and women and dating and what, 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 how do you, you know, for a man, how do you attract a woman and how do you have a good relationship? So many lies about that, so much perversion about it. So the first step is just to get those truths. You got to free yourself from the propaganda. You got to turn off the TV. You got to unlearn the lies from school. You take the red pill like Neo in the Matrix, right? Now this is only the first level. This is just the social human society level. Sun, you know, Santiago, there's the whole uh, psychological and spiritual levels which are much, much deeper and higher. But first, I think you got to just start it with the very practical. You know, how do you make money? This, th that's also part of the red pill, the financial red pill. Because as Robert Kiyosaki showed us and taught us with Rich Dad, we're all given these lies, these blue pill uh, lies about money and how money works and how, how do people become rich and how do they stay rich. And this creates a lot of unhappiness because people are believe these lies. So you got to wake up from that and start to see those hard truths. See the hard truths about society, about history. We're taught most of the history we are taught in schools. There's a whole lot of lies mixed in there. Lots of propaganda and lies. You got to you got to find out for yourself. So how do you do it? Well, you look for independent sources. One of the great things that I recommend all the time is to read old books. Read old, old books. Older books, right? They're, they were more connected with those big truths. They were more honest about life, about humans. <laughs> so you try as much as you can to read older books. Instead of reading a book about Julius Caesar, read Julius Caesar's book that he wrote. Yes, he might have had some exaggerations in that book because he wrote it. He wanted to make himself sound good. But still, it's a direct writing from him, the man himself. That's amazing. Read Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, the great Roman emperor, emperor who wrote a whole book. You can read his own words directly. You don't have to read some, you know, Marxist uh, professor from Harvard who wrote about him and is trying to lie and has a trying to push a bunch of modern politics. Forget that. Read what Marcus Aurelius wrote directly. Read his thoughts. Read his philosophy directly from him. Read those old books. Read the Iliad. Read the Odyssey. And then at the next level, as you start to become socially red-pilled about economics and social life and money and all of that, as you do that, then you can become more red-pilled about psychology and philosophy and start searching for the truth of those big questions. Exactly what we talked about yesterday, where you just start by asking the questions. You just start by constantly asking those big questions. You start by searching sincerely, just like Santiago. He didn't have the answers in the beginning, but he just went searching for the truth. And that's when you can read even better old books, those old books of philosophy, the old books of the saints, the prophets, yeah. The Upanishads, the Gita, the Dhammapada, the Sutras. 
the scriptures of the in the Middle East, right? The Bible and Quran and Old Testament. Not only religious, but the philosophical too. Aristotle and Plato, especially those old philosophers. A lot of the new, a lot of the people who came after Aristotle and Plato were really just commenting on Aristotle and Plato. It's quite amazing, actually, how the roots of Western philosophy really go back to those two. And then, of course, Eastern too. Tao Te Ching, Sun Tzu, Confucius. The ancient literature, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the th Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the Ramayana, and many more. <laughs> I'm just giving you a, kind of the highlights of some of my favorites, but many, many more. Just go searching for the truth. I'm not going to give it to you. I don't have it all myself, but I will tell you this. There's a lot more of it to be found in those old and ancient stories and books and philosophies than anything you will read that was written recently. Truth. Truth is a wonderful journey. And it never ends during your lifetime. The second antidote Right? That's truth is the antidote to perversion. Find the truth and speak the truth too. When you know something's a lie, you say it's a lie. I mean, that's why I'm always going on about this transgender stuff. It's not that I don't really I don't I honestly don't care about what those guys do. If some guy wants to cut off his penis and dress like a a woman, I honestly don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I don't hate him. I, I don't care what they want to do. What I do care about is the political agenda so in the media, the billion and billions of dollars of the media pushing that as normal, pushing that as okay, telling us that we have to agree that that is correct and good and truthful, telling us that we must call that man a woman or else we are hateful or else we are bad people if we don't tell this lie, if we don't pretend and go along with the lie. That's what angers me. That's what I will not do. I will speak the truth. That's why I bring it up. It's the only reason I bring it up, but I know it's a perversion. It's an obvious perversion. These people are mentally ill perverts. I don't hate them, but I also don't admire them. I don't respect them. Kind of feel sorry for them, actually. But they, but this issue is being used as a way to push even more perversion. And if we accept that, if we, if we go along and we say those lies, oh yeah, yeah, she, Bruce Jenner is a woman. If we, if we do that. If we go along with the lie, then they will just push even more perversion. They'll move to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. They will never stop. You have to fight it with truth. That's why it's an important issue. It's the only reason it's an important issue, in my opinion. They push this homosexual stuff on us again and again and again. And as soon as that became accepted and seen as normal and allowed and the whole in, in America, we have the whole gay marriage thing. As soon as that happened, I mean, immediately, like the, the next month, they started to push the transsexual stuff. And that's when suddenly we heard about Bruce Jenner becoming a woman and Caitlyn. And, and now it's they're pushing, pushing, pushing that. And if we allow that, then it will go to the next thing. And the next thing is probably sex with children. Because I can already see they're starting to push that. That's the direction it's going. That's what happens when you allow, when you go along with lies. So you have to fight it with truth, and when you have this massive media pushing the lies, it, it can feel difficult to say the truth, because you know they've got a whole lot of professionals who are going to criticize you and attack you. No, no, you hate them, you hate them. You're transphobic, you actually, you hate them. You're homophobic, you hate them. And it doesn't matter how many times you say, oh, I don't hate them. Oh, I have a family member who's gay, or um, I have friends who are gay, and I don't mind. But 
I'm not going to say that this transgender stuff is normal because it's not. So you just got to say the truth. And it's not just that, you know, it's the same with politics. It's the same with economics, right? This is why, you know, I say the truth about college. College is mostly nonsense. It's mostly a waste of money, at least in the United States. It's not always a waste of money. There are some situations, some top, some subjects that people study, some degrees that people get that are, you know, a good choice. It's, it's a logical way to spend money because you spend money, but then you, you get a job and you make more. And so it's a good investment. So sometimes it's a good choice and many times it's a terrible choice in America. And I think in many parts of the world, larger and larger numbers of people are going to college, getting huge debt, like they're borrowing tons of money, tens of thousands of dollars to get a degree in, I don't know, women's studies or, or <laughs> I'll use my own example, journalism, that was equally stupid. Um, and then they get out of school with a huge amount of debt and they get a job that pays very little. A job they did, don't really need a college degree for. I've used the example that in America, if you go to a Starbucks, probably half the people, maybe more than half of the people working at Starbucks have college degrees. It's crazy. Why? You don't need a college degree to make coffee. <laughs> it's just insane. <laughs> what a waste of money <laughs> and time. <laughs> So it's another truth that's not popular. People get upset when they hear that because they've been told this lie. Oh, college, college is so important, college. So truth. The next one is self-discipline. It's it's the answer to addiction. They're being, we're being, all these addictions are pushed on us, right? Hedonism. And the antidote to that, the solution to that is to develop your self-discipline self-discipline is the key not someone else controlling you that doesn't teach you anything it doesn't make you stronger at all if someone else makes you do things it's self-discipline it's self-control right it's ultimately self-mastery you are controlling and mastering yourself you're not a slave to your desires Meditation is a fantastic, perhaps the best way to develop this kind of uh, emotional and mental self-discipline. Emotional discipline is a big one. This is one where, especially you'll see in the media, where, uh, I don't know what you might call it, emotionalism is encouraged, right? being very dramatic and oh my god and, uh, uh, it's kind of an American thing but I, I notice it is being pushed in uh, media everywhere in the world now to, to just react to act very emotionally kind of overly emotional about everything no emotional control right to get easily angry and upset about even small little things for example well, the opposite of that, the solution to that, is emotional discipline. To recognize that you don't have to react to every emotion. Just because an emotion comes up, you don't have to act on it. In fact, it's usually best not to. So, just because you get angry about something, that it's good to learn self-discipline, to stop yourself when you get angry. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. This is where meditation can help. You just focus on the anger. You don't try to push it away, but you just focus on the feeling of anger in your body. You notice the angry thoughts in your mind and you just observe them like a, like a scientist. You just see what's happening and you notice what's happening. And just by doing that, just by looking at it, not pushing it away, but not reacting, just by looking at it, observing it, you'll notice that the the power of the anger will drop. It probably doesn't disappear, but it, the power, the strength of it will go drop quickly because then you're starting to use your, your rational mind, your, right, your, your higher intelligence. 
just by looking at it. So now, instead of the emotion controlling you, you're feeling the emotion and then you're looking at it. And then you can learn something from it. You know, maybe you look at it and you realize, you know what, yes, I'm angry because that person did something bad to me and I should be angry. And, but then you can think of a, an intelligent response. Instead of just screaming, ah, or just getting upset, or just crying, or whatever, you can stop yourself, notice the anger, and then notice the situation, and then choose an intelligent response. Now, maybe the res intelligent response sometimes it is to yell at a person. If someone's threatening you on the street, eh, maybe you gotta yell, go away, go away. Other times, if it's someone you love and care about, sometimes, often, the better response is just to stay silent and maybe just walk away and calm down and come back when you're calm and then have a nice calm you know caring discussion it depends on the situation depends on the person but if you just react immediately right you're not thinking clearly and that's when you know people get angry and then they yell and say terrible things to people they love or they do stupid stuff like you see I you get on YouTube you see all these things like people driving right and they get angry and they do something and really dangerous they cause an accident all these kind of things so emotional discipline getting control over your emotions not getting rid of them but learning to control your reactions to them so that you use the emotions instead of the emotions controlling you another way to develop self-discipline is physical training you know it's one of my favorites is any kind of physical training where you're uh, trying to improve your body physically in some way uh, requires self-discipline right doesn't matter what it, is. it could be strength training some people really love lifting heavy things and hard strength training that's great it requires a lot of self-discipline for sure it's right to constantly trying to go heavier and heavier and heavier weights and more difficult lifts that requires a lot of self-discipline uh, on the opposite you know some people are more focused on endurance I'm, I'm probably more of an endurance guy and so think doing like marathons and ultra marathons and long hiking trips and uh, uh, but again trying to go farther and longer or sometimes and faster even things like bodybuilding where you're focused more on the appearance of your body it still requires a lot of self-discipline bodybuilders have to have a huge amount of self-discipline to uh, build that muscle and then cut out all that fat and get that look that they're trying to get it's not easy and of course any kind of sport if you're trying to improve in a sport it, it doesn't matter tennis golf whatever and again it requires focus and concentration and lots and lots of self-discipline and all of these things will help you as you try to eliminate these addictions and that's the other thing start cutting these addictions out of your life reduce the amount of time you're on social media I'm doing that myself Reduce the amount of time you're on your cell phone. Reduce the amount of time you spend uh, listening to music that's not beautiful and doesn't, you know, have great lyrics and good messages. And right, reduce the amount of time you spend watching TV and movies. And instead, right, read those great books or just talk to people you love or just relax in quiet. <laughs> that's also nice. <laughs> Develop equanimity, right? That balanced mindset where you don't get too upset where you're not grabbing on to pleasure too much you're not running away from um, difficulty too much self-discipline so for, we have our antidotes our medicines number one is truth number two is self-discipline and number three beauty the answer to noise the solution to the noise the ugly noise of the modern world is beauty natural beauty natural beauty and this is why I love 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 just getting out into nature there's nothing better it doesn't require any kind of money you don't need to go to a museum it's it's not created by humans at all right forests fields right grass <laughs> mountains oceans rivers nothing better than that natural beauty it will heal you it really will you know you, you get in the you get in the noise and the ugliness of the modern world too much in a city or a town or whatever there's 
the quickest way to start feeling better is to get out into nature and just experience the natural beauty. You, all, you just need to be out in it. You don't have to do anything. You just got to look at it and walk around and you'll start feeling better. You start, you go for a walk each day in the mountains and a trail. You, you, you know, you take a little vacation for a few days. You go to the beach and you swim in the ocean and watch the sunset. It's so simple. Beauty is healing. Real beauty. Natural beauty. Not the perverted junk they give us in the media, but the real thing. It's so simple. At night, just looking at the moon and the stars. It's simple, it's free, that natural beauty is very powerful. It's a great antidote to the noise. Another great one is silence. Quiet. Something sadly missing from our world. As you just saw when I got really annoyed by all the banging noise when I was, I was talking to you. <laughs> it drives me crazy. This is one that I really don't like and uh, the antidote, the medicine for that one is silence is a great source of beauty, in fact. Silence is beautiful. We say silence is golden in English, right? It's, a, uh, it's an idiom. Silence is golden. It is. Now that can mean socially, silence is golden, meaning don't gossip. But I think it has a deeper meaning, which is just silence is also healing. This is one, one of the things that makes meditation uh, powerful for healing you, for making you feel better and more at peace and more happy, is just sitting there and making your mind quieter. Right? Your mind becomes more quiet. And when you meditate, you need to do it in a silent location. Don't do it in a noisy environment. And I've been meditating a lot lately, and uh, uh, I do it in my apartment, which is mostly quiet. But even still, there's a little noise from outside the street, so I wear earplugs and earphones, both, to block out almost all noise. So that I'm just sitting there in a, in, in a deep quiet. So my environment is very quiet, and then my mind becomes quiet. That's beautiful too, you'll notice. There's something beautiful about quiet. Or even being out in nature. You'll have, nature's not generally loud. Right? You go out to the mountains, you'll hear sounds, you know, the, the wind and the trees. And, but the sounds of nature tend to be much more quiet and beautiful, right? They're not distracting, they're not noisy. The little, little songs of birds, things like that. And then in terms of human-created beauty, if we're talking about art, I think the, again, if you look to the old masters, because I, they, you can't compare. I, look, I'm a Led Zeppelin fan. I like Led Zeppelin. I like the Beatles. But, you know, when I listen to Beethoven, like ninth, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, I mean, it, it's not even close. I just, I have this feeling like what happened to us as humans to go from that level, Beethoven's Ninth, down to the Beatles. And people say the Beatles were such geniuses. Compared to Beethoven, they were not. Not even close. Okay? <laughs> the Beatles, the truth is the Beatles wrote some catchy, nice little songs, which I like. And many of their songs have a nice little message of love or something. But a lot of their songs are just silly. There's nothing wrong with that. And Led Zeppelin, they wrote a lot of, you know, loud, energetic, powerful songs, which are fun to jump around to. And again, I like it. But is it beautiful at the level of Beethoven or Mozart or Bach or, you know, that whole period? Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. And the same is true, we know, of modern art. Modern art is garbage, mostly. And in, certainly if you compare it to the great masters, you know, the, that, that Renaissance period, the Italians, and, and really, you know, and then spreading out from Italy into you know, f France and Germany and all over. But, you know, there was this, that certain time period where they were capturing some some kind of deeper human beauty. And 
so much like reading old books will connect you with deeper truths and deeper beauty so too will older art older music architecture same thing right i mean i you know this is one of my personal uh beliefs or values but just that modern architecture is hideously horribly terribly ugly and again you go back and you look in terms of europe you look at the uh that the middle ages uh, well even rome even if you look at the old roman architecture the old greek architecture go to athens and look at the acropolis it's stunningly beautiful and then, of course, the, the old churches and cathedrals and just even average regular houses and buildings, just the plain old normal houses and buildings from those time periods, they're, we can feel it immediately. You see, it's more beautiful. Even America, which is a more recent country, if you go to, uh, let's say you go up to Boston and you, or you go to uh, some Philadelphia, you go to some of the, uh, the East Coast, the old towns or cities and you see some of those old really simple buildings really they're simple little houses simple churches simple little shop buildings that go back you know to a few hundred years immediately you feel something they're just they're prettier right there's there there's oh, they, you're just looking at them there's something you feel good they feel more warm there's a beauty there and then if you look at a modern house a big modern house it just uh, it, like there's nothing right it, it it's useful it keeps us warm and all that but there's no beauty so there is something about it we've lost it right we made a big mistake right say it probably started back I don't know when it really started, but certainly 19th century. I mean, that probably in the 19th century, but definitely by the 20th century, meaning the 1900s. There's this idea that everything old was bad, right? We thought we we're going to master the world with technology and that we'll reject everything from the past. We'll reject all the old human wisdom. We'll reject the old art. We'll reject the old music. We will reject the old societies will reject the old values and beliefs will reject everything from our ancestors all the centuries of thought and wisdom and the questions and the searching will reject it all because now we are the masters of the world right we have atomic energy we have science we have cars we have airplanes we have computers now we are the gods and it didn't work <laughs> we have tremendous technological power and we have a miserable society that has no meaning filled with people who feel no purpose filled with people who feel lonely filled with ugly art ugly music ugly architecture ugly culture ugliness lies perversion addiction and noise i don't think it's worth it i think it's a bad trade <laughs> i don't think the technology is worth it i like the technology but if if we have to have perversion addiction and noise i'd rather just go back and live a simpler life <laughs> much rather i think most people would but we don't have that choice that's not for us we don't have that power so we do our best in this world even though the good news is even though we are surrounded by all of this that individually individually we can find this truth this self-discipline and this beauty we can we can create that in individually ourselves we can create it in our families and then in our extended families that's how we reverse this that's how we begin to heal the sickness this global sickness that's my belief truth self-discipline and beauty truth self-discipline and beauty we'll talk more about these this weekend with 
the alchemist finishing up the alchemist of course you know uh, this topic today is inspired a bit by the alchemist as i think about the end of the alchemist and the messages that coelho is giving us truth self-discipline and beauty join my vip program commit to my vip program at effortlessenglishclub.com effortlessenglishclub.com add my pronunciation course to at effortlessenglishclub.com go now to effortlessenglishclub.com